So I want to speak tonight on tongues of prophecy. This subject may be new to you, and maybe you speak in tongues and prophesy often. The point of bringing these things up is to equip us for spiritual warfare and also to, dis to discern uh, a spiritual climate. We need to discern the spiritual climate that is all around us. And let's, let's just say this for a moment, okay? Uh, a lot of times spiritual people, spiritual people that get real spiritual, you know, uh, we need the Spirit, but we need the Word of God. We need the Word of God because we need sound doctrine. And the living Word has life in it. The power of the Word, the word when the Word goes forth, it never returns void. So there's power in the Word. There's life in the Word. There's life-giving power in the Word of God. But we need the Spirit and the Word. We need a healthy balance, and we need sound doctrine. Let's not get into the realm of, you know, I sense it, I feel it. I can I can taste it, I can sense it, but you don't have sound doctrine in it, okay? Jesus is Lord. That's the first doctrine I'm going to teach you, hallelujah. Jesus is Lord of all, the name above every other name, the power above every other power, the power greater than any other power is the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Thank you, Jerry, for jumping on. Uh, thank you, Ravin Drudu. I hope I pronounced that correctly, but let's keep it going, brothers. Let's keep it going, sisters. Let's start with 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 11. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 11. And the chapter, uh, chapter 12 talks all about the spiritual gifts. And like I said, we're going to be going through this series together. We're going to, going to really uh, get deep into the gifts and what they mean, how they operate today. There's many who think that these gifts have passed away, that they were only for the apostles, that they were only for that time, but it's just not true. It's for our time, and I want to see you moving and operating in these gifts. So 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 11. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another, the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit work all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. The Holy Spirit distributes these things as He wills. We know God does as He pleases. So as you can see, tongues and prophecy are separate gifts given to believers. There are also two different types of tongues. And there's the gift of diverse tongues. All right, we're going to get into that as well. What's the difference between a personal prayer language and diverse tongues? Really, they're two different giftings, although they are both tongues. There is a personal prayer language available to every believer. Don't let anyone tell you tongues is not for you. You can't receive the gift of tongues. There's tongues available for every believer, but this type of tongues is a personal prayer language that edifies your inner man, it edifies your spirit man, but it also is used in intercessory prayer as you pray for others, as you pray for different situations, and your, your words fall short. You don't know what to say, but the Holy Spirit speaks and prays within you for that situation. You begin to utter, you begin to utter words that you do not understand, but they are speaking to that situation. You're praying in the Spirit. You know, Paul talks about pray in the Spirit at all times. We need to pray in the Spirit. Because those things we're praying in the Spirit, in tongues, are addressing the things around us, the situations that we don't know what to do in, and the situations that we don't know how to handle. So this is one type of tongue. There is a separate gift of tongues called diverse tongues or different kinds of tongues. Diverse tongues means you speak in another language as a message for the body of Christ. It's not a gift for the individual believer. This type of tongue requires an interpretation, which is yet another gift called interpretation of tongues. So why do I group tongues and prophecy together as our subject tonight? Why do I group them together? The truth is tongues is a form of prophecy. These gifts complement one another. 
1 Corinthians 14, 2 says, For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the Spirit he speaks mysteries. The fact that this verse says he speaks mysteries is proof that we prophesy when we speak in tongues. Prophecy is revealing the unknown among many other things. Prophecy is also considered a divinely inspired utterance or revelation. Prophecy can also be a divinely inspired prediction, instruction, or exhortation. But if you're only beginning to prophesy, if you are uh, feel like you're called in a prophetic way, if you feel like you may be, uh, that God maybe is raising you up to be a prophet, I would say don't start off by predicting things. Unless God gives you that word and you're 100% sure that that word is true, that it's certain. With all of your heart you believe it. Don't make that prediction. I'm warning you right now. I've heard this from many prophets and prophetic people. And they've warned me against it. They've warned others against it. Don't make predictions if you're just starting out prophesying. Do more of an encouraging with, uh, with people. Encourage them. Exhort them. Just saying Jesus loves you is a form of prophecy. You're revealing something to them that they did not know. It's possible they didn't understand that Jesus loved them. It's possible that you're imparting a revelation that's so simple, but yet again, it is prophecy. We need to remember this. It's not about predicting future events all the time. That does happen, but that is very rare where you're going to predict a future event and that's actually going to be a sound and correct an on-point word. Tongues and prophecy both pull back the veil, so to speak, that we can see into the spirit realm. Let's focus on 1 Corinthians 14, 3. It says, he who prophesies does three things. Okay, he who prophesies does three things. Number one, he edifies or instructs. Number two, he exhorts or encourages. Number three, he comforts. He comforts. So I had to decline that call. Sometimes I get calls coming in while I'm going live and I just have to decline them. We're right in the middle of something here. So he comforts. One who prophesies comforts. They bring comfort. You're bringing comfort through edification or excuse me, through exhortation. You're bringing comfort. You may, you may offer some encouraging words, but it's not just encouraging words we're talking about. It's something, it's a message you're giving to this person by the power of the Holy Spirit, through the unction of the Holy Spirit, that is going to bring comfort to their spirit. Not only to their mind, but to their spirit. I hope that makes sense to you. If it doesn't, please ask questions. Ask questions, and I'll try to respond to them accordingly. And it's best to ask questions while I'm on here so I can address them. Because later, I don't always do a good job at getting back to people. I just have a very busy schedule, and I don't interact on social media very much. Okay, not these days. Hallelujah. I have a wife. I have children. I have a ministry. Um, but if you're talking to me on the live feed, if you're putting messages and comments up, I can address them while I'm on the live feed. That's the best thing to do. So God will give you pieces until the full message is given. He rarely gives us the entire message all at once because he wants you to trust his leading he wants you to be ever standing and moving in a place of faith he keeps you in a place of faith by only giving you a part of the message he wants you to be reaching and seeking and longing for another glimpse another taste hallelujah for example you may hear brother then like i said you hear something about this brother you're going to get a piece, and then you're going to get another piece. It's going to build, okay? You may be afraid of getting it wrong or, or being embarrassed. We all feel that way at times. We all feel like, you know, I look like such a, a goofball. I look like such a dork going out and saying these things to these people. But you know what? Jesus took he, uh, Jesus took those lashes. He endured the pain. He endured the suffering of the cross. He didn't care what he looked like. He didn't care what it looked like when he endured that pain, when he endured that agony, when he hung on that cross. He didn't care what it looked like. So we can't care what it looks like when we go up and tell someone that Jesus loves them. You may be afraid. You may be confused. You may feel shy. 
but you need to break through that barrier if you're going to see results in the spirit. If you want to be effective, you must exercise the gift on a regular basis. Okay, this is another key. If you want to be effective in prophecy, in, in prophetic gifting, you need to practice this, practice this on a regular basis. For me, if I'm not witnessing to people on a regular basis, I begin to feel a fear and a shyness building in me when, in fact, I'm very bold in the Spirit. But if a week goes by and I don't say anything to anyone about Jesus, I start to feel this little bit of fear that starts building. It's because you're not operating in it. You know, you if you haven't done something in a while, you got to shake the rust off. You got to break the rust off a little bit. You got to get back into it. You got to get some momentum. You got to build momentum in the Spirit. And as you do that, you'll begin to see more and more results. And the Holy Spirit loves it. He sees the obedience. God sees the obedience as you're stepping out again and again, and you're not sitting on the gift that God has given you. Don't sit on the gifts that God has given you, but use them. Put them into practice for the glory of the kingdom of God. So one should prophesy in the Holy Spirit. Prophecy isn't from the mind. It goes much deeper. It reveals the deep things of God. And I'm not talking about psychics. I'm not talking about reading your fortune, reading your palm. I'm talking about the spirit of the living God operating, giving us words, giving us messages, giving us dreams and visions. Sometimes you'll have prophetic dreams and visions that will bring forth prophecy. You'll get a message. You'll receive a message in a dream, in a vision for someone. Sometimes you'll have a vision just as you're standing there praying for someone. You'll receive something uh, in a vision or a word from God. We need to operate in these things, brothers and sisters. We need to step out in these things. You need to understand this is not from the mind. It's not just, oh, I thought about something and I said it. No, this, is, this goes far beyond that. It's a spiritual thing. Spiritual things are only revealed by spirit. The things of the mind, the things of the flesh are revealed by flesh. And the enemy can have his way with you if you stay in the flesh. But if you stay in the spirit, the Holy Spirit will minister to your spirit and will, will reveal to you many, many things. There is healing and power and salvation in every line of prophecy. Once you got a word and you get, or excuse me, you get a word and you sense that God has released you to speak it, then step out of the boat quickly. Don't allow your mind to get in the way. Don't allow your mind to put a spin on it. All right. Sometimes your mind can taint a prophecy because God gives it to you a certain way, but you add your own thing to it. Okay. Um, let me give you an example of that. Okay. Say God speaks to me and he says, say to that person, uh, Johnny over there, that he's supposed to possibly look into going to this college. All right. But then I put my spin on it and I say, and maybe they're going to give you a scholarship. You know, I'm adding something to it. I'm adding something to the prophecy. Don't add to the prophecy. Don't take away from the prophecy. Speak exactly what God is saying. Don't put your own flavor. Don't put your own spin on it, please. You want every word to be directly from the throne room. Every word directly from God's mouth, from God's spirit. Next, let's turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 19 to 22. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 19 to 22. Which reads, Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Again, this goes back to consecration. This goes back to setting ourselves apart. This goes back to not quenching the Spirit. We quench the Spirit when we resist the Spirit. When God is speaking something and we think, well, is this really from God? Or we act in the flesh, we speak in the flesh, we speak things that we think are true. No, receive from the Spirit, move in the Spirit, operate in the Spirit, and you will see spiritual results. You will see manifestations of the presence of God. Verses 19 and 20 are written together for a reason. It's because despising prophecies will quench the Spirit of God. 
Let me say that again. Despising prophecies will quench the Spirit of God. Verse 21 goes on to say, test all things, hold fast what is good. We need to test prophecies to make sure they line up with Scripture. And I must add that we have to check our motives when delivering a word. We have to check our motives. If you want your motives to be purified, you need to line up with the Word of God. You need to ask Jesus to purify your heart. It's not something you can do on your own. Sanctification, purification is not something that is of us. Again, it's of the Spirit. If you want to know God, God is Spirit. If you want to know Him, you must know His Spirit first. I've seen people give words that are designed to suit a need in the ministry or another area of the church. This type of false prophecy is manipulative. And controlling this type of false word is a form of witchcraft. Okay, those who are operating in control manipulation with intimidation. That There's that, uh, that coupling. There's that combination that makes it witchcraft, that identifies it as witchcraft. Control, manipulation, and intimidation is almost always witchcraft. And ministers operate in it, prophets operate in it, or so-called false, you know, so-called prophets, false prophets operate in it. If you're acting in love, if you're doing things in love, if you're doing things for the benefit of those who are part of your congregation, if you're doing things for the benefit of those who you're in relationship with, it is not witchcraft, but if you're doing it to meet your own agenda, it very well may be witchcraft you're messing with, and you need to repent and turn from that. Lastly, verse 22 says, Abstain. Abstain from every form of evil. And we can't allow the gifts to be corrupted and tainted by evil. This leads people to using gifts for their own gain. This never ends well. Although they may accumulate wealth, fame, and success, there is a price to pay. Without true repentance, you pay with your soul. That leads us to the topic of false prophets. Let's turn to 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. Which says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. But this you know, by this you know, the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. So many false prophets have gone out into the world. We have to use discernment and find out whether the Spirit of God is in operation or a spirit of Antichrist. A spirit of Antichrist will deny the deity and divinity of Jesus. This spirit will also deny the authenticity of God's word pertaining to who Jesus actually is. You know, there's many false gospels that are in the world today. Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, and many different strange doctrines that have been uh, devised. Many things that the enemy has spoken to people that they've taken hold of and believed to be truth, but they are deceived. And this is so important that we get this. It's so important that we get what the Antichrist spirit does. So if you want to know more on it or you want to um, really understand it, it, the phrase that I just said, the excuse me, the paragraph that I just said is so important. I'm going to read it again. I just feel led to read it again. A spirit of Antichrist will deny the deity and divinity of Jesus. This spirit will also deny the authenticity of God's word pertaining to who Jesus is. That's what you need to know most about the spirit of Antichrist. On the other hand, the spirit of God will always bear witness to the word of God. And he will always bear witness to a prophecy delivered in faith and purity. By purity, I mean holding fast to what is good and abstaining from what is evil. Revelation 19.10 says, For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. 
when we hold to the truth of God's word and testify about who Jesus is and what he's done in our lives, we create a prophetic atmosphere. All right, get this. When we witness about Jesus, when we talk about who he is, what he's done in our lives, we create a prophetic atmosphere. That's an atmosphere where the prophetic comes to the forefront, where people begin to receive words and have visions and see things in the spirit that they wouldn't normally see. Let's keep in mind that regardless of the gifts we've received from the Lord, we should remain in Christ's love. We should live out this love that cancels sin, sickness, and sorrow. That's a word God gave me when COVID first came out. The love of God, the perfect love of God, cancels sin, sickness, and sorrow. Understand this. There's things doctors cannot do. There's times when doctors said, there's nothing more I can do. And God comes through with a miracle. God comes through. His love cancels sin, sickness, and sorrow. We're not to fear these things as children of God. Without love, the unction of God's Spirit is hindered. Without love, Paul talks about all these gifts, all these abilities, all these things will cease without love. Even tongues and prophecy themselves will cease. They will fail without love. We need to have the love of Christ in our hearts. His love in our hearts that's poured out by the Holy Spirit into our hearts is what causes these giftings to operate. And when people teach on the gifts, they don't teach this enough. First, you need the love of Christ in your heart before you ever attempt to operate in any of these things. All we're left with without love is our own power, a human power, which is really no power at all. 